Hey guys, it's Alex. Before we start the show, we wanted to let you know about something really exciting that we are launching here at Gimlet. Three very exciting things. Three brand new podcasts that are going to be launching all the week of November 14th. At the end of this podcast that you're listening to right now, we will play a special preview of all three new shows. Also, you can go to gimletmedia.com slash fall season to learn more and subscribe to these new shows. And now, here's Startup. I'm Alex Bloomberg, and for a long time I was a producer at the public radio show This American Life, and also the co-creator of a podcast called Planet Money, where for years I reported on business and the economy. It was a great gig until I decided to do something rash. I decided to take what I learned from reporting on other people's businesses and start my own business. Are you meeting someone with money? (laughs) This is my wife, Nazanin, early one morning a couple months ago, stopping me as I was on my way out the door to do something I'd never done before. Meet a guy who works at a venture capital firm and try to get him to give me money. To invest in my business. A podcast business. I love podcasts. I love making them. I love listening to them. But there's all kinds of podcasts out there, from a couple people talking around a mic to the kind that I make and that I have a particular soft spot for, which focus on storytelling and journalism. Those podcasts, they take way more money and resources and time than the other ones. And probably because of this, there aren't that many of them. To me, it seems like there aren't enough of them. It seemed like someone should come up with money to invest in making new shows like these and come up with a theory about how those shows could be profitable. I kept waiting for someone to do that. And then came this thought, a thought that's gotten a lot of people into a lot of trouble. The thought, well, I could do that. You don't like these tennis shoes? No, they're fine. At a certain point, I realized starting this company, this is a story, a story a business reporter like me would have killed for with behind-the-scenes access to all these embarrassing details that never get reported. Like, for example, when you're about to make your first ever pitch to an investor, how do you dress? Business formal? Tech casual? My wife took issue with my shoes. They're fine. They're just... There'd be a higher chance that he's going to give you money if you're not wearing running shoes. Do I think that's true? These are the only shoes that I can wear that my feet don't hurt. (laughs) So yes, you are listening to the first episode of a podcast mini-series I'm making about the starting of my podcast company. Meta, I know. I've been recording pitches to investors, difficult negotiations with my co-founder, tense conversations with my wife. I'm calling this mini-series Startup. It'll be six to eight episodes or so, airing roughly every other week. And I'm in the middle of things right now. I have no idea how this all ends. What I do know, we have a two-year-old and a four-year-old My wife has a demanding job where she works till 11 o'clock most nights a week. I'm leaving a full-time job with a good salary and benefits for an uncertain future. Our plan, if you can call it that, is to spend down our meager savings, go into debt, and hope it works out. I have a lot of anxiety. Nazneen has a lot of anxiety, which is all focused at this moment on which shoes I should wear. I don't know, you think these look better? I'm not sure they look better. I think these look like nursing shoes. Why did you buy them? To play tennis in. Oh, they're like actual tennis shoes. Yes. Oh, okay, then yeah, where are the other ones? <laughs> there are over 28 million businesses in America, and I imagine they almost all started the way mine is, with nothing but a story. A story I'm telling not just to my investors, but to my wife and to myself. That story that we all tell ourselves, when I'm telling myself too. I'm the guy in the garage with a great idea. I am Steve Jobs. Not the real Steve Jobs, of course. The Steve Jobs of HVAC repair. The Steve Jobs of farm-to-table gastropubs. Or in my case, the Steve Jobs of 20 to 40 minute weekly podcasts. The problem is, most of us are emphatically not Steve Jobs. Of the hundreds of thousands of businesses that start every year, only three in 10 survive out the decade. This podcast is the origin story you never actually hear, set down before the facts can fade into sunny startup mythology the most honest and transparent account I can make about something that happens every day in this country, but we hardly ever see firsthand. Starting a business. Chris? All right. Hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. (laughs) Thanks for meeting me. It's Friday lunch, mid-spring, and I'm at a hole-in-the-wall sushi place on Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles. I've flown out here from my home in New York to meet a guy named Chris Saka. Chris is the kind of guy that people like me need to sell our story to. He's a professional investor. Now, before I was in public radio, I was a teacher, and before that, a social worker. I've worked in nonprofits my entire life. If I actually start this business, CEO of my own company will be the first full-time job in the private sector I've ever had. 
All this to say, Chris Sock and I traditionally run in different circles. But this is where covering business helps. I met Chris on a Planet Money story I worked on about the patent system and how it seemed to be slowing innovation in Silicon Valley. Chris had a lot to say on the subject, so I ended up talking to him for a while. Years later, when I was starting this company, I reached out to him about being an investor. Honestly, he was one of the only people I knew who did this for a living, invested in stuff. And he remembered me. Turns out he's a fan of This American Life. And so he said, sure, come on out, we'll talk. And I knew that Chris was successful, but I didn't realize exactly how successful until over lunch, he told me his own origin story. It started back when he was a strategy and ideas guy working at Google. Yeah, I was still at Google when I wrote my first seed investment check. It was in a company called Photobucket. The guys at Photobucket needed money to get their company off the ground. Chris wanted to give them that money. There was just one problem. I didn't actually have the money required. And they said, hey man, it's, it's easy. It's a $50,000 minimum check. And I was like, yeah, sure, okay. And so I wrote two credit card checks to cover it. They, they said all we need is 50 grand and you didn't have 50 grand. No, I, I definitely didn't have 50 grand. But if, you're, if you worked at Google, you were perceived to be a millionaire automatically. So of course, uh, I would just assume that I had that kind of money and I definitely didn't. But Chris loved this feeling, placing early bets on companies he believed in. So he saved up a little money and left Google to become what they call in Silicon Valley, a full-time angel investor. Turns out he had a good nose for picking winners. One of Chris's first investments as a full-time angel was in a company a former colleague of his at Google was starting. That colleague's name, Evan Williams. The company, Twitter. Evan showed Chris an early prototype of the idea. It was compelling and a little bit addictive and released dopamine every time your phone buzzed with a new tweet. And it played on a little bit of narcissism and exhibitionism and exploration. All these things were happening that were pretty exciting. And so when Ev gave me the chance to invest in that company, I found it irresistible. He wrote a check for 25 grand, which he probably had no business doing. He had a little money, sure, but 25 grand was still a lot of cash to him. Unlike the majority of investors in Silicon Valley, who Chris says can break off a check for 25 grand like it's nothing. He really needed his bet to pay off. So he just started showing up at the headquarters of Twitter, trying to help out however he could. He also became a huge evangelist for the company, talking it up to anyone who'd listen trying to drum up investors. And eventually, I had this revelation. I was like, fuck it, why am I putting all my energy into trying to convince these people? Instead of convincing everybody else it's going to be valuable, if I actually deeply believe that, then I should just start buying all the stock I can find. Which he did. Dug deeper into his savings, took a bet he already had no business making, and doubling it, and doubling it again. To say this gamble paid off is an understatement. Chris Saka wouldn't say exactly how much he personally owns of Twitter, but at the time of Twitter's IPO, his venture funds owned the single largest stake in the company, roughly 15%. Twitter currently is valued over $20 billion. For Chris, what began with a single $25,000 investment is now a stake worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, one Twitter in your portfolio is something any investor would dream of. Chris has a lot more than one. Kickstarter, Instagram, Uber. He was an early investor in all of them. And he's developed something of a philosophy for successful investing. Sure, you evaluate the idea, you look at the numbers, kick the tires, that's all important. But he says, he also looks hard at the conviction of the people who are pitching him. The ideas that we back and the entrepreneurs we back, there's so much conviction about the inevitability of success. It's contagious. I mean, when I first sat down with Kevin Systrom, the founder of Instagram, and he started talking about why Instagram and pitching me on why I should get involved there. I sat down with in the back of my mind, look, photo sharing has been done a bunch of times. Uh, I feel lucky to have already gotten some money back out of photo bucket before. Like I might be the one guy who is in, who made money in photo sharing and there's no way lightning is going to strike twice. But as you listen to him, you get the perception that he's actually looking through you to some spot behind you that's five years in the future and he just knows the inevitability of the success of his platform. And by the end of the conversation, you're like, please take my money. So what starts as this like, all right, kid, what do you you got? It's just like, wow, let me get on this thing. The train is leaving the station. This was thrilling to hear because that conviction, I actually feel it. And conviction in general is a pretty rare feeling for me. I'm much more intimate with doubt and ambivalence. And Chris is like a teacher handing me the answers to a test he's about to give. 
explaining exactly what he wants to see from me in order to invest in my company. I need to project conviction, check. And I need to instill FOMO. For you non-millennials, FOMO is an acronym, fear of missing out. Airbnb, multi-billion dollar business, right? I was one of the first people to see the Airbnb pitch. And I pulled them aside and said, guys, this is super dangerous. You're renting out a room in somebody's house while they're still there. Somebody's going to get raped or murdered and the blood is going to be on your hands. There's no way this will succeed. That's a $10 billion business today that I'm not an investor in. Dropbox. I saw the Dropbox guys and I was like, this is great and everything, but Google's going to crush you. They have a thing internally called G Drive and it's going to absolutely crush Dropbox. There's no way this thing's going to succeed. That's a $10 billion business today that I'm not an investor in. A $10 billion business that I'm not an investor in? That is FOMO. Once you have FOMO on your side, says Chris, you no longer have to ask people like him for money. They're lining up to give it to you. Coming up, I make my pitch to Chris, but first, and I'm serious about this, a word from our sponsor. This episode of Startup is brought to you by Lenovo. Lenovo is revolutionizing data center technology. And if you don't know what that means, just look down at your smartphone. Look at all those apps. We're downloading as a a planet about 50,000 apps every 60 seconds. So every minute, uh, we're doing 50,000 app downloads. Don Frame is the brand director at Lenovo. Don explains that Lenovo data centers help those thousands and thousands of apps run smoothly. So you can do whatever you need to with those apps. Goof around or run your business. The applications, and we're not just talking about playing games. Obviously, Pokemon Go and all those things are, are, are fun to do. Um, but there are many applications that are enabling us to become uh, more efficient, do things faster, get information quicker. Um, and that's not going to stop. So 50,000 apps downloaded every 60 seconds, that is going to get bigger, not smaller. To learn more about how Lenovo is developing scalable, reliable, and innovative data center solutions, go to www.lenovo.com slash data center. Startup is sponsored by Squarespace. With Squarespace, you don't need to know code or be a developer to have your own beautiful and professional looking website. That's because Squarespace has really smart developers who create tools that you can use to make your own website. People like Cole Krumholtz, who's the engineering lead for the developer platform at Squarespace. And Cole loves his job. He's a natural at it. He's been doing it since he was a kid. Anytime that you get to build something with software, it's both creative and imaginative. Pretty early on, it was a it was a way that I could sort of make fun of my brother in a pretty effective way. I wrote this little program and I told my brother to sit down and to use it. And the program asked him, what's your name and what's your favorite color and a couple of other simple things. And then no matter what answers he wrote in, it would at the end, sort of evaluate his personality and tell him something like, you're a dork. Um, which which was much more effective than me calling him a dork. To have the computer tell him that he was a dork was a new and difficult thing for him to grapple with. Squarespace. Making it so you don't have to be an engineering whiz kid to torment your little brother. Anyone can do it now. And make it beautiful, too. Right now, use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com, offer code STARTUP to get 10% off. So I traveled out to see Chris Sacco with what's called a pitch deck, which is basically a PowerPoint on a laptop telling the story of what my company is going to do and how it's going to make money. Not surprisingly, you can read a lot on the internet about how to make a killer pitch deck. And like screenplays, pitch decks are supposed to follow a standard 3X structure. What's the problem out there? How is my company going to solve that problem? And how is solving that problem going to make huge amounts of money for everyone? And usually there's a conference room, maybe even a large screen monitor where you plug your computer into, show your PowerPoint. But after lunch, Chris says, okay, let's take a walk. You can give me your pitch. And that's how it came to pass that right there on the sidewalk along West Pico Boulevard, I made my pitch to Chris Saka. Well, I have a deck, which I'm like, which yeah, I've used yeah, for people. Yeah, was but it, it, it was a crutch. I got used to it. All right. So what's my, yeah. So, yeah. Pretty much immediately, so, all the so, confidence that I felt during the lunch evaporates. Remember the structure, Bloomberg, I tell myself. Problem, right. solution, money. Here's the problem. In the world of audio right now, most people consume the, the kind of audio journalism that I do. Most, of, most people consume it over the radio. Those people are leaving the radio in droves and they're migrating to digital. They're migrating to digital listening. The uh, number of 
Obviously, smartphone handsets are going through the roof. The audio dashboard is becoming digital. iTunes radio, podcasting is all going to be on your dashboard. Um, and there's this whole world of... So there's all these people going there. And I want to start a company that will create the content for all these people to listen to who are like moving into the digital future slash present. Digital future slash present? Who says that? If I'm honest, I sound like a douchebag. Dropping all this jargon, instead of saying listening to the radio, saying consuming audio. Also, notice how the more nervous I become, the higher my voice gets. So you're, you're uniquely positioned to do it because you're better at it than anybody? Yeah, I am. I apologize for that. I'm doing so badly that Chris is now stepping in and feeding me lines. One question he asked, what is my unfair advantage? I knew this was a critical question, but I had no idea how to answer it. Not only do I sound like a douchebag, I'm not even doing it that well. I'm the wrong kind of douchebag. Still, I sallied forth. I explained to Chris my plan on how to make money. Ads, of course, but the second main revenue source, you guys, listeners. Not that we would charge for podcasts, but for those of you who don't obsessively read everything written about the future of media, there's this concept called freemium. It basically means you make your stuff for free, And then you offer a little something extra that some percentage of your listeners will pay for. One time we did this on Planet Money. We did a project where we followed a t-shirt around the world and interviewed the farmers and factory workers involved in making it. We offered that shirt for sale and our listeners bought a lot of them, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth. And after years of being in public radio and doing the pledge drive and begging people for money and talking about we need this to keep the lights on, this project felt refreshingly straightforward. Here's something we made you guys want to buy it? Great. So that's how I explain it now. Here's how I explained it to Chris in the language of douchebag. And I believe there is a huge opportunity in audio specifically to really do the thing that all media is dreaming of doing, which is making this, making this freemium model work. As I watched Chris Saka's face cycle from bored to confused to annoyed, I realized despite being given the answers to this test ahead of time, I'm still somehow failing. I am generating no FOMO in Chris Saka's heart. If anything, I'm generating the opposite. You gotta tighten up your story. So the- We'll start again. So you've now kind of meandered really tight this time, how you're gonna make money doing this? So you you make money a combination. So there's three major, there's three major revenues streams. I start again. I meander my way through the ad rates, planet money. At a certain point, I find myself deep into an explanation of my friend's successful Kickstarter project. Chris interrupted. You lost track your own outline. Yeah, I did. What you what you haven't given me is the outline of your story, right? Uh-huh. If I were calling an Uber right now and it said it's going to be here in two minutes, and that was all the time you had, uh-huh. what are you doing? So I'm making a network of digital podcasts uh, that we will monitor that that will that will that is going to meet. <laughs> Sorry. I'm imagining the people out there listening right now who actually know who Chris Saka is. I didn't realize his reputation when I first arranged to meet him. I thought he was just a rich guy in Silicon Valley. But after enough conversations with people who were like, you're meeting with Chris Saka? I realized that in this world, he is this huge kingpin. Not a murderous criminal underworld kingpin, a universally admired, really friendly billionaire kingpin that pretty much everybody with a startup idea wants as an investor. In other words, this walk we're taking along Pico Boulevard, thousands of people would kill for this opportunity. And I'm blowing it. Chris eventually drops the pretense that this is an actual investor meeting and just starts coaching me on my pitch, feeding me questions, and then correcting my answers. And so what's it going to take to do it? So it'll take a million and a half dollars, I think. Um, and Take out the I think. Yeah. It'll take a million and a half. I'm looking for a million and a half to two million dollars in seed no, stage no, funding. No, no, no. no. Yeah. You're looking for a very specific amount of money. <laughs> I'm looking for a <laughs> Finally, after about an hour of this, I look over and see Chris holding up his hand. Give me a second and I'm going to give you your pitch back. All right. But let me write down a couple things quick. Okay, great. And then right there on the corner of Pico and Bundy, he steps into the role of me. Starts giving the pitch I should be giving. Hey, look, can I get two minutes from you? So here's the thing. You probably know me producer of This American Life, a successful radio show, top of the podcast, and iTunes, etc. So here's the thing. I realized 
there's a hunger for this kind of content out there. There's none of this shit. It's just a bunch of jerk off podcasts. Nothing's out there. Advertisers are dying for it. Users are dying for it. And if you look at the macro environment, we're seeing more and more podcast integrations into cars. People want this content. It's a whole new button on, in the latest version of iOS. So here's the thing. Nobody else can make this shit. I know how to make it better than anybody else in the world. And so I've already identified a few key areas where I know there's hunger for the podcast. You got the subject matter. We're going to launch this shit. I know there's advertisers who want to get involved with it. But here's the unfair advantage I have. Because of what I've done in my past careers with This American Life with Planet Money, people are actually willing to just straight up pay for this stuff. And I'm not just talking about traditional subscriptions. I'm talking, we did this t-shirt experiment at Planet Money where we got $600,000 to come in where people actually gave us money to buy a t-shirt with our logo on it as part of the content. It was integrated directly. And I know we can replicate that across these other platforms. So here's what we're doing. We're putting together a million and a half dollars that's going to buy us three, four guys who are going to launch these three podcasts in the next 12 months. We think very easily we could get to three, 400,000 net subscribers across the whole thing. With CPMs where they are in this market right now, I know on advertising alone we could get to break even. But as we do more of this integration, we get people buying some of this product, doing some of these integrated episodes. I know that what we're going to have on our hands here is something that will ultimately scale to be a network of 12, 15 podcasts. The audience is there. They want it. Nobody else can do it like we can. Are you in? That, that was amazing. That's your story, right? <laughs> that is great. Holy shit. So what that was do, good. So good that I'm thinking, oh, if he pitched my idea that well, he must be into it, right? He's going to invest. But then he goes on. I could come at it from the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Media is very, very hard, as you know. This content's really hard to consume. It's longer form. You're counting on people spending that kind of dedicated time. I mean, you're fighting an overall trend of attention, and every other format is going to shorter and shorter content pieces. And so you're actually swimming upstream with that stuff. You have a lot of platform risk because you're depending upon Apple and Google to distribute your content. The kind of stuff you're doing with Planet Money is exciting, but it's all under the veil of being a nonprofit. People feel a moral obligation to contribute to those kinds of things. You come outside from under the public radio veil and you have to worry about whether people are gonna be a little bit jaded and feel like they don't necessarily need to donate to a for-profit company to make for-profit content for guys who are doing this for equity and hoping to get rich. You know, frankly, you think you might actually be uniquely qualified to do this, but we've started to see more and more news podcasts make their way up there. Some stuff from Khan Academy is moving up the ladder right now. so. Ultimately, you're not going to be the only guys in here, and it's going to be pretty competitive. Audio is kind of a niche market, and so I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this is a fit for us. At this point, I have no idea what to think. I'm drained. My pits are drenched. And Chris Saka has just given me two completely convincing cases in favor of and against investing in my business. Whatever shred of conviction I had about this process at the beginning is gone. I also learned something about how investors like Chris see the companies they might invest in. I came out here thinking I could build a nice, profitable business. But Chris isn't looking for profitable. He's looking for Twitter, something huge. Or if not Twitter, then at least a company he could sell to Twitter. He asked me this question, what would the exit be? And by that he means, what large company will buy your company in three to five years so investors like me can get our money back at 10 to 100 times the amount we put in? I hadn't really thought about that question. I don't know if I want anyone to buy me. This experience with Chris makes me realize the simple vision I have, it's not a vision people like him are looking to invest in. Still, Chris is not saying no. Let's do this, he says. Go back, hone your pitch, and the next time you're out here, make it to my partner, Matt. He's from the media world. He worked at a big talent agency in Hollywood. If you can convince him, then I could see us doing something together. I say goodbye get in my rental car, and head to the airport. Coming up, scenes from the next episode of Startup. But first, we've got a lot of stuff coming up on future episodes of Startup. Here's just a couple scenes. I get an answer from a potential investor. Where are you leaning right now? I mean... <clears throat> So I think it's diff I mean I think it's difficult to, to think of this as a venture scale business based on what you guys have said. So you're leaning no. I, I think so. And I get some feedback from my wife on a potential name for the company. Orello. Orello? 
what is that what is that supposed to mean well it's uh it's ear in esperanto <laughs> <laughs> You can hear how I got to a place where I actually thought Arella was a good name for a company coming up on an upcoming episode of Startup. How can I find out about upcoming episodes? I'm glad you asked. If you go to hearstartup.com, H-E-A-R startup.com, all one word, you'll find everything you need to know about subscribing to the program. There's links there to iTunes, SoundCloud, and our Facebook page. Many thanks to our design partners at Athletics, a creative agency in New York, for help building that site. We used original compositions in the show today by Tyler Strickland. Our very special commercial break theme music was written and performed by Build Buildings. Our theme song was by Mark Phillips, who also mixed this episode. There's links to all this and more at our website, herestartup.com, H-E-A-R startup.com. I'm Alex Bloomberg. I'll talk to you on the next episode of Startup. Thanks to our sponsor, Lenovo. Lenovo is revolutionizing data center technology. To learn more about how Lenovo is developing scalable, reliable, and innovative data center solutions, go to www.lenovo.com slash data center. Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. Remember to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Hello, listeners. It's Alex Bloomberg, CEO of Gimlet Media. I am here to tell you about some really exciting news. Our brand new fall season. That's right. We have reached the point where we have so many new shows coming out at once that we can actually call it a season. It's crazy, right? And we're really proud of this lineup. We've got our first scripted podcast with actual professional actors that are in movies and TV shows. We have our first ever true crime series and a new nonfiction show. And you know how at the movies they have previews of upcoming features? That's what we're doing right now. So first up, our first show out this fall, it's a show called Undone. It's hosted by the award-winning producer and journalist Pat Walters. You may know him from a little show called Radiolab. Here, Pat will tell you about it. When big news happens... I'm about to sign into law. The Civil Rights Act of 1964. We all tune in. More and more Americans are getting more and more into the disco scene. For a little while, at least. It was one of those things no one ever doubted. But those stories don't just end when the news people leave. They keep unfolding and evolving and shaping the world we live in now. We had no idea what was going to happen. I was so eager to put it behind me. You know, we got a little taste of freedom here, and uh, it was good. Undone is a new show from Gimlet Media that digs up the surprising things that happened when we weren't looking. So that's Undone. It premieres November 14th. Next up this fall is something completely different, a show called Homecoming. And it's different because it's something we've never done before. It's a scripted fiction series, meaning it's a TV show for your ears. It's a psychological thriller set in this sort of mysterious facility for returning veterans. And it stars, are you ready? It stars Katherine Keener, Oscar Isaac, David Schwimmer, David Cross, Amy Sedaris. And I'm just going to play you a little clip just to give you a sense of what it feels like. This is a clip when the main character, Katherine Keener, is confronted by a mysterious agent in a diner. So how was everything? Oh, here? wonderful stuff. Good. Uh, anything else? No, 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 no. I'll be right back. Oh, uh, say Heidi, yeah? That's your name? Yep. Just just like the name tag says. Have you been working here long, Heidi? Um, uh, about four years, I guess. You are Heidi Bergman, right? That is your last name? Yes, do I know I'm you? I'm Thomas Carrasco. I work for the Department of Defense. You worked at the Homecoming Initiative. Well... Yes, that was years ago, but uh, what is this? Hi, what is I, this I just have a few questions for you. I don't how, really how have How long any did you time. work at, at the Homecoming Initiative? Wait, can we, I, I have a break. Can we, can we talk outside? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, right now? Yes, out back. Oh, I'll meet you there. Okay, just, okay. I'll be right there.
That's Homecoming, premiering November 16th. And then finally, this fall, we have a new project from Zach Stewart Pontier and Mark Smerling, the makers of The Jinx, the HBO documentary about Robert Durst. Their new project is a podcast produced with us called Crime Town. And it is an epic series about gangsters and crime and corruption. And it's set in the biggest city in the tiniest state in America, Providence, Rhode Island. So I'm going to let Zach and Mark tell you about it. The thing you got to know about Providence, it was a mob town. I had a fucking meat hook in this pocket, a, an ice pick in this pocket, a fucking blackjack in this pocket. The cop looked at me and says, what the fuck are you? Here we are, policemen, bringing girls in, having wild sex on the benches of judges. Honestly, I had, you know, I would have never imagined that he would have taken people's lives. Not my father. And you'll hear from the guy who ran Providence for more than 20 years. Good morning. Buddy Cianci. My name is Buddy Cianci, and I'm the mayor of Providence. As you know, I've been indicted by federal prosecutors. I assure you that I'm not guilty of these charges. They're based on self-serving statements of criminals. In this city, it's hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys. Mark and I have spent the last year digging through transcripts, courtroom testimony, and FBI wiretaps. And there's a lot to this story that's never been told. All right, so they are handing off a box. Mark's got the box in his hand. Oh, my God. And on it is written, Buddy Tapes. Holy shit. That's all coming up on this season of Crime Town. Crime Town premieres November 20th. That is our fall launch. We couldn't be more excited about it. We hope you're excited about it, too. To learn more and to subscribe to all these great podcasts that we have coming, go to our special landing page, gimletmedia.com slash fall season.